soundtrack, if you will. So the question uh, that they were dealing with is, is the church relevant? Did you catch that? Is the Bible relevant? Did you catch that? Is your Christian faith relevant? I chose that video, and it, it was moving if you could actually see the pictures. That's just people talking. Uh, because I had a, a pretty heated discussion, debate with somebody about that just this week. Is the Bible relevant? And the person I was debating with, well, he, his conclusion was, well, I mean, if I was debating the guy, you probably, you probably can guess. He concluded that the Bible was not relevant. Uh, so what I did was I invited him to services today. He did not come. Uh, which, have you ever had, a, now I know you, I've preached some pretty crazy sermons here, correct? Amen, testify. And sometimes, maybe you brought a friend on that day, and the day they came, you're thinking, I wish they would have came today. I don't know, maybe you thought that, or maybe I wish they would have. This was one of those days that I invited somebody to church before I actually looked at the text, because I was talking about, is the church relevant today? Is the Bible relevant? I was just, then I went to study the scripture that we're going to focus on today, and I read the scripture, and I'm thinking, they're just going to freak out if they come because of the passage right here. It is relevant. It is relevant. I'm not even saying that. But here, let me read today's passage, and you tell me if maybe it would have raised a little eyebrow if your main question is, is the church relevant? 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Pound it, dog. I was ne uh, next door with your kids, just so that you know, when you talk to them and ask them what Pastor Mike spoke about today, yes, it was maggots, yes, we talked about flies, yes, we talked about poop, but it was a good sermon. It was be thankful for everything. Okay. 1 Corinthians 8, now, about food sacrifice to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but what builds up? The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrifice to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came, and for all whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and all through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have knowledge eating in their idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. Could you imagine, just for a second, if my friend were to come here this week, and I read a passage about meat sacrificed to idols. My question to you is, is that relevant in today's culture? Do we have a big problem with meals above barbecue? Do we have a problem with demon delicacy? Is there a problem in our culture today about meat being sacrificed to idols? If you're searching for an answer, the answer is no. We don't have a problem with meat being sacrificed to idols. It's just not there. I think the biggest problem that we have, as I see it, when it comes to meat is should we or should we not eat dog? 
your conscience is weak. And you've never been to Korea and you've never had dog. Had you been to Korea and had some dog, you might be a little bit hesitant to answer that. Yaki Mandu, we called it the Marine Corps Puppy Mandu. A very, very nice delicacy. <laughs> Have you ever eaten pepperoni? Uh, those pizza rolls? Tastes like that. It's very good. <laughs> Are you never going to eat a pizza roll again? <laughs> That's what I'm going to have for lunch today. <laughs> I, I've got a dog. <laughs> Eat that thing. Oh. I, I just want to quickly step back on this passage right now because the fact is we don't struggle with Meet me and sacrificed idols, and I, and I hope you know that. Um, but that wasn't really the whole gist of what was going on back then. They were having something we would call is a moral dilemma. Okay? Um, I, how many of you would, would if, if you bought a house, and, and you went into the basement, you bought a house, you did the walkthrough, you, it was a beautiful house, and, and, you know, stained glass windows, if you like that, or whatever it is, just perfect wooden floors right there. You never went into the basement, for whatever reason, but when you got into the basement, you walked into the basement, and there was a Ouija board. Open. With the... You just said, wow. With, isn't that like a triangular piece or something there? And then maybe blown out candles all the way around it. Would it cause you a little bit of... I mean, would you kind of just do a little quick step back, right? I mean, anybody here freaked out about Ouija boards? So a few of you are kind of freaked out about Ouija boards. I mean, it's just a game, though, right? So, so, I don't know. You attach that. Could you imagine back then, every time you went to the supermarket, every single time you went to the supermarket, um, they lived in a pagan culture society, and what they did was they would, they would sacrifice animals to their pagan gods, and even Paul acknowledges later that every time a, a, a sacrifice to a pagan god is actually a sacrifice to demons. So, I mean, that was the thought back then. Could you imagine every time you went in and you saw your hamburger meat right there, that it was so closely attached to demons? Uh, it'd be a problem. Because you had two choices. One, you could not eat meat. How many of you would freak out? You can't eat meat. Amen. Testify. Are there any vegetarian freaks in here? I shouldn't say freaks like it's a bad thing. But are there any freaks? I've got a couple of friends who... Dogs this morning. <laughs> we used to, like the first time somebody would eat the dog meat, the Marines, we, we would tell them... They didn't like that. Um, that was our thing. Happy Veterans Day, veterans, by the way. I mean, it was a moral dilemma. You don't eat meat, or if you eat the meat, it's associated with pagans. Now, some in the church had no problem with it at that time. It's just meat. It's not a big deal. That's kind of what Paul argues here. Other people, though, in the church would have such a big problem with it that when they saw their friends eating the meat, you know, it would, it's a moral dilemma right there. And that's what I want to really talk to you about today is moral dilemmas or moral decisions in general. You do, let's, let's kind of build a quick foundation here. You do understand that some moral decisions in life are extremely easy to make, correct? Okay. Let me give you an example. Stealing. Okay. How many of you right now have a problem with stealing? Show of hands. <laughs> you have a problem with stealing. Okay, as in, not that she steals, she doesn't struggle with it. Everybody's looking at Miss Barb like, Miss Barb is the thief. Aren't you in charge of the finances here at the church too? We're going to have like this special meeting or whatever. No, she has a problem that it's wrong. You guys are the wacko ones. You don't have a problem with stealing? Come on. How many of you got a real issue with thief? Theft. Stealing bad. Stealing bad. Right? It's an easy decision to make. You shall not steal. Where's that at, by the way? In the Bible. In the Bible. Um, how many of you uh, what, uh, play Facebook at, at work? Just anybody? Just wondering. Facebook?
Facebook at work? Are you stealing? Just, I, I don't know the time from you. I don't know. Just, it's a question. You guys can struggle with that later. Um, I've got clients that come in. Uh, remember, I do the financial counseling over in uh, Champaign that, that admit to stealing. Um, because they don't know how to get food for their kids. So how many of you could understand a dilemma there? Should I steal? Or should my kids starve? There's a moral dilemma there, I, I would think. Now, of course, I try to show them and teach them that, you know, that's a false dichotomy. Oh, those of you who, who read logic books at night know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, fallacies. Who doesn't like a good fallacy? There's a problem with their thinking, and we try to, you know, just try to comprehend their, their, their thinking. But you can at least see a moral dilemma. We face, I, I think, in our culture today, probably more, more than in any other time, more moral dilemmas than we can possibly imagine. That never before in the history of time that we have these problems. What about, um, what is it, the, uh, uh, is it, I'm trying to, stem cell research, where they take what? Fetuses, okay, they're really, really small, they're just a speck, and then they harvest them for the purpose of what? Killing them and dissecting them. Is that a moral dilemma? Some of you say, no, you can't kill, but there are benefits, too, from that. But I, I would think that, I mean, that's kind of like the, the big moral dilemmas that we have nowadays. Um, I, we saw, I saw one, if you paid attention to the election, there was a guy in Indiana that actually said that, and he was, I think he was a Republican, he, he made the statement, he was talking about aborting a child in the case of a rape. He said, well, the rape was in God's plan, so we shouldn't do that. And I'm thinking... I don't know if I'm, yeah, I don't know if God was, you know, that was his will that a person would be raped. And, but could you see a more dilemma there? I think that you should. I mean, regardless of where you're standing, there's, there's still the dilemma. Um, but simple dilemmas. Every day I think that we face. Is it okay to go in late for work? Or is it okay to, to borrow time from the employees? We face them all the time. Sometimes right is not easy. Sometimes wrong is just not easy. Sometimes there is a dilemma involved with it. So I guess the question today is how does a person determine what is right and wrong? How do you determine what is right and wrong in our culture today? Is it legal? We have a lawyer right here. Is it legal? Sorry? If that I... doesn't always answer the question, though. It doesn't, does it? No. Uh, did did y'all see that uh, here, uh, two states legalized marijuana? I don't know if that makes it legal. I don't really care your stance on it right now. Maybe we'll talk about it here in a second. Um, I, I was interested enough. Did you know that kids were asked, kids like uh, 18 and younger, were asked, is marijuana immoral? You know what the number one answer is? Yes, it is. Then they ask the why question. Why is it immoral? Because it's illegal. So if you legalize it, does that make it moral? Yes, that makes it moral. We've got kind of a problem with that. There are a lot of things that are illegal that are what? Immoral. Is lying illegal? Sometimes, to Congress it is. Is lying legal? With Congress, yes. I mean, we kind of expect that from our politicians. If they're not, if they're talking, or lawyers, if they're talking, they're generally not, well, not John, Tim. That's not nice. He's right there, whispering. Um, what? John is John is a good lawyer. All lawyers are good down deep, six feet. That was funny. Oh, that was hilarious. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe the question, how do I determine right and wrong, is not relevant to you. I don't know. I don't know. My friend, I don't think that that question was really important to him. Um, 
my friend, uh, again, he doesn't think that the church is relevant. He doesn't think that the Bible is relevant. All right? and, and, and we discussed, and I know his worldview. He knows my worldview. I know his viewpoint. I know his philosophy. We're, we, we talk quite a bit. He knows my philosophy right there. We would both agree that God is not central in his worldview. Okay? He just doesn't believe in God. And he's, he's come to upset that. He's, a, he's an atheist. He's a practicing atheist. And he's really cool with that. I also know that, my friend, and he would agree. That you're you're going to meet him. I know that you will. You, that, that his number one dilemma in this world, his number one question in this world, is how do I make myself happy? You're laughing because that's, actually that's fine. That, there's nothing wrong with that, giving his worldview. In fact, I would submit that logically he is very he's he's consistent with his beliefs. He's accepted this idea that there is no eternity. He's accepted that this idea that there is no God. He's accepted this idea that you only get so many times around this planet. So how do I stay? Happiest during my trips around. Some of you think, well, that's just weird. It's just selfish. No, that's common. In fact, Paul said it too, didn't he? He said, if by some chance there is no God, if by some chance there is no heaven, if by some chance that the only thing you've got is a few trips around this world, then why not? It's only logical. Eat and drink for tomorrow do die. My friend is consistent. He wants to know what is going to make him happy, and what makes him happy is stuff that brings him pleasure. And he wants to avoid pain. So when I asked him the question, how do you determine what is right, and how do you determine what is wrong, his answer is simple. Right is the things that bring me the most happiness. Wrong is the thing that brings me pain. Is the Bible relevant to him? No. How could it be? This Bible doesn't tell you how to be happy. This Bible doesn't tell you how to avoid pain. Quite the opposite. The Christian is it relevant to the Christian? I think so. As a Christian, what is your number one goal? Somebody, shoot. Worship God. Worship God. To love Him with all you got. Who is it that you seek to please? Yourself? Who? You seek to please God. You want to do what makes God happy, if you will. I'm talk emotionally. You want God to be happy by your actions. Right and wrong, they sometimes matter, doesn't it? Because we need to determine what God thinks is right. We need to determine what God thinks is wrong, and we need to follow what He says. Men, how many of you want your wife to be happy? Only one, and two, three. <laughs> And the missus today, she's saying. <laughs> How do you make your wife happy? <laughs> she goes, oh, no, no, man. <laughs> That's the dilemma I face every day. I wake up and look at her. This ain't going to happen today, is it, baby? <laughs> Men, today, when you go home, look at your wife in the eyes and say, baby, what would you like me to do? That question alone will make her happy. Number one. Number two, do what she says. That'll make her happy. It will. That's it. Try that. Same with God. You really need to know what God thinks on the matter. You really need to know what he says, and you really need to do it. Okay? That's common sense, if you will. And I'm not asking you guys to make God happy so that he enters you into heaven or something like that. We don't believe that here. You're saved by what? Grace. grace. You're saved by faith. And faith alone, by grace. He says, 
I'm going to kill my son, so I have to kill you. That's what, that's what salvation means. I want you to, to, to want to make God happy, to want to obey Him, to deny yourself, to carry your cross, to follow Him. It doesn't matter what He says. If He says suffer, you suffer. If He says give away all your stuff, give away your stuff. I want you to obey Him, not to earn your way into salvation, but because you are saved. In fact, it says in 1 John 2, verse 3, that we know that we are in Him, that we know that we are saved if we obey His commands. Not if we obey His commands, it saves us, but we know that we are in Him. So I want you to want to make God happy. I think Tim was absolutely on the mark. That's one of the reasons why we exist. Mm. And I think that if you truly want to please Him, the Bible is clearly relevance. I have heard this, and I, and I want you, by the show of hands, and we do interaction here, a show of hands if you've heard this from Christians. From Christians. Christians can be a general term right there. Don't just assume that a person is only a Christian if they're Baptist, but I want you to think of your entire Christian circle and, all, and, and your entire conversations about the Bible. How many of you heard that this thing is written by humans? Two, three, just that? Four. How many of you have heard that this thing is somebody's interpretation? What they think? A few of you? I'm going to say as Baptists, this is Baptist doctrine, we believe that this book is from God. We don't just believe that because that just sounds like a good idea. We believe this book is directly from God because it claims that it is directly from God. 2 Timothy 3.16, who has it memorized? All scripture is what? Inspired. Inspired. That is King James Version. NIV says it's God breathed. I think that if you look at the word, it's... Breathed is better because inspired can mean so many things. How many of you write songs? I wrote a song the other day. A dandelion inspired a song. I like dandelions. Okay, that's that was the song, the, the extent of the song. You're a singer back there. I was supposed to put you up on stage one time. I will do that. Um, God inspired the word gives this idea that somehow my idea of God inspired me to write. Not necessarily, but this says it's God breathed. It comes from that. And second... Peter, it says that no prophecy, no scripture came along by man's will. But God, by the will of God, carried along the words came into existence. This is from God. If it comes from God, it is his opinion. It is his thoughts, his ideas on something. So when it comes to moral decisions, right and wrong, in here, we got that. So, I want to look at this text, but I also want to get a, a, a general understanding of how you, brothers and sisters, Christians, can determine what is right and wrong by working from the absolute to more of the abstract. Does that make sense? I'm using big words, it's okay. Move from the absolute, it's a matter of fact, this is right, this is wrong, this is what absolute truth is, to the abstract. Stuff maybe not covered, we call those gray areas. Are you ready? Here you go. Number one way. To determine what is right and wrong from the Christian worldview so that you can do what it says, please God, is the Bible. It is the Bible. Is the Bible clear on a lot of things? Does it not say thou shalt not lie? Anywhere in the Bible. You really need to pick up your Bibles if you don't know the answer to this question. Does it say, thou shalt not lie anywhere in the Bible? Yes. Yes, yes thank you. I don't know what version you're looking at. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Maybe that's your more King James Version people here. All right. How about, thou shalt not be sleeping around? What page? 23. Am I, I know. Our camera guy's trying to follow me around. I wore high heels, so it gets me higher up in the air. Um, that ain't going to help. <laughs> How about no murdering? Is the Bible clear on that? We have to use the word murder, though. Because does the Bible say no killing? You can kill. Better not drop that. The Bible's clear on a lot of things. 
I am, when it comes to, of course I've had classes um, in college when it comes to consumerism and, and how to spend the money and how to budget, all that right there. But when I bring that ministry out there, I'm simply a pastor. Because the Bible says so many things when it comes to your finances, it's crazy. When I do marriage counseling, I don't do it, although I've had psychology and I've read the books and the different stuff. When I do the counseling, I don't do it as some psychologist outside of the faith. I do it as a pastor because the, I don't know if you know this, but this has a lot to say about being a husband. It has a lot to say about being a wife. When I counsel people on uh, being a parent, they're surprised. There are some absolute truths in here that you should follow and you should have, you should do, even if it doesn't feel comfortable. How many of you do not feel comfortable spanking your kids? So I don't, really, for at least two of them. <laughs> Three of them, I kind of encourage it. <laughs> Connor comes up and asks for his daily spanking before nine. Not in those words, but pretty much. <laughs> No, actually, Connor's grown to that age where I don't apply corporate punishment. I um, have studied different things. I don't believe that once you reach a certain age, not so much. But when they get that big, then you got then you got to knock them out. So I'm okay with that. I'm a potter and he gives you one. Let's go. Yeah, but he's sure. I know. <laughs> See, that's like my wife does the, the the daycare and stuff. We got you know Bella will do something like come here, Bella. Bam, right here. Somebody else do it. Like God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't do that. But I'm not him out. <laughs> the Bible has a lot of things. You may not like it. In our culture right now, the, a lot of people don't like what it says about marriage. We don't like what it says. Uh, I'm not saying you don't like it. I'm just saying the culture doesn't like what it says. But it's clear on what it says. There are absolute things, and, and we do. We absolutely 100% need a fault because they are oh, their truth. It, it just doesn't change. Uh, so much. And I think that the Christian, if you are in Christ, and if you care to please yourself, I guess that's fine. It's your choice. I have no problem with that. But the Christian who desires, how many of you want to please God? Boom, boom, boom. None of you. Just John. Okay, we got three of you. Four, five. There's seven, eight, good. Eight people that want to please God in the church. I'm going to put that on Facebook and boast. I have eight. I have at least 20% of the church who wants to please God at our congregation. Uh, Bragging and other pastors who don't have 9%. I don't know. If you want to please God, I think that you need to commit yourself to at least listening to the word preached by a pastor who believes that the word, that this is the word of God. Number one. Two, read it. Just say, pick it up. Follow breath. Read it. Three, put it to memory. Really simple. Why? Because it's the foundation. I, you know, I, so there are times people come up to me, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, what should I do? And, and I cheat. I use my memory. It's like, you know, the Bible has actually talked about this. I, I think you need to stick with what the Scripture says. Right here. The, the Scripture says this. You need to, it, God is pretty clear on this. This is what He says. I'll even show the page number. The Bible verse right here. It's like, put this to memory. How many of you have asked me a question and I've sent you a Bible passage? Anyway, a few of you. I send you the Bible passage. Because that's truth right there. But I want to add something to that. Everybody knows that there are firm stains in the Bible that says, this is what you should do. Everybody knows that now. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes it doesn't cover things. This is where I'm going to start getting really... Some of you are going to freak out on some of the stuff I'm going to ask you. We'll start easy, though. What Bible passage forbids us... forbids a woman to get an abortion? That shall not what? There, there's a problem with that. When you step on a fly, are you murdering? When it comes to abortion, a majority of the people who say abortion is okay agree with you that you should not murder. They don't view it as a life. The answer to the question is, it doesn't say. It just doesn't say. We'll, we'll get to that, because I think that there's steps to get there. 
How about gambling? What Bible passage says you shall not gamble? Yep, do you have one? There is none. This passage about being a good steward. Absolutely. There's a passage that says don't do it for the great money. But is there a passage that specifically says gambling? We'll get to that in a second. But what about those passages when you have to make a decision between what is right and what is wrong? Let me, let me give you a, a, a biblical scenario. This is, this is in the Bible. Go back to the time of Moses. Go back to the book of Exodus. Go back to the chapters 1 and 2. You don't have to do it right now. But there was a problem. The Jewish people were rising up, and a new king had rose up, and he forgot the promises that was made to um, Joseph. So he, he forgot the promises, and he saw the Jewish people not as a blessing, but as a curse. So he devised the plan to get rid of the Israelites, to limit them and keep them small. What was the plan? To kill the, kill the, babies. Kill the babies. And who was he? Who did he instruct to carry out that plan? Midwives. Does everyone know what a midwife is? They were like nurses back then. Their job was to catch the baby, right? So Paul's that. He said, when you when they are having the baby, you are to tell us so that we can come and kill the baby. So they had a choice. They could tell the truth. Baby is born. Or they could lie. If I tell the truth, someone is going to get hurt. If I tell a lie, life comes. Is God big on killing? No. Is he big on lying? No. Hey, you got that commercial break ready? Let's put that commercial break up. We can do commercials here. That's how I make my side money. Was Abe Lincoln honest? Does this just take my best friend on thing? Perhaps <laughs> Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Sometimes we do have a decision to make. I'm just talking about quick moral dilemma. Sometimes you can be honest with people, but you know that that honesty is really, really going to hurt them. Is God big on honesty? Yeah. Is he big on not hurting people? Yeah. You see how even the simplest thing, you can, you, we can bring this down. So is the Bible relevant? Absolutely right there. Um, I saw something in this passage that I, as a logician, some, what's a logician, John? A logician is what? Somebody who loves words? No. Logic. Logic. Who? I love logic. You say, I want you to get pastor a book on fallacies. I will read it two or three times. I love logic. I want you to catch something there. What happened was, back then, during the time, you had the church who had a dilemma. They had a moral dilemma. It wasn't covered in the Bible. So what they did was they asked Paul a question. They said, Paul, that we've got meat being sacrificed to idols. We don't know what to do because the Bible isn't really clear on this. What do we do? Paul, verses 4 through 6, does something. He uses logic. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know, look at this, he, there's your premise, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is only one God, the Father, from whom all things came and all whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom all things live. We call that using your brain. Using your brain. Everybody, really quick, take your left hand and put it on the left side of your head. Do this now. Put your right hand, put it on the right side of your head. If you've done this, you've messed up. Do this. Everybody, I'm not, well, just take Susan. I, it's going to mess your hair up. I know it, Miss B. Please play along. The stuff in between your hands as Christians, you ought to use it. Okay, you put it there. Now, I don't believe in blind faith as it's 
used in church today. Because the Word of God, from day one, He's given us evidence. He says, look at what I did with Israel. Jesus says, look at my hands. He says, these things are written so that you might believe. He gives us facts. He gives us knowledge. He lets us know things about God. And it is absolutely okay to try to put them together. My friend, here's what he did. He took, he took what he knew of the world. He took the idea that there is no... And, and, and he admits this. He says, I take the idea that there is no God. There is no eternity. I take the idea that this is all we get. And I come to the logical conclusion that, hey, party like it's 1999 because tomorrow doesn't matter. We Christians need to do that, but we need to start with the premise that there is God, that He's revealed a lot of things to us, and it's okay to put them together to come up with some truth. Biblical example. Abraham. Are you familiar with Abraham? Abraham didn't have the Word of God. He didn't have the first five books. He didn't have the Old Testament. That didn't come around until Moses. But he had God's Word. God told him a few things. One of the things He told him was a promise. He said, Abraham, through your son, who is... I... Who... Isaac, you guys got to play along. Isaac, I'm going to bring about many nations. So Abraham believed that truth, and he said, okay, I believe that. And then he told Abraham a command. Abraham, take your son, your one and only son, and I want you to sacrifice him. Okay? How's that going to work? If I kill the boy, how is it even possible... He ain't had any kids yet that many nations are going to come through. But the New Testament tells us what, what, what Abraham did. Abraham reasoned. He used his brain. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. God can raise him from the dead. So I believe the promise, and I'm going to be obedient, and God will raise him from the dead. Of course, we know that's not what happened. What happened was God stopped him and says, no, 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 don't do this. I see that you're obedient. We'll do this. And we know that that's also... A, um, a, I guess, an imprint of what would actually happen through his son, Jesus Christ. So he used his brain. Can we use that today in moral dilemmas and moral problems? I believe so. Is it wrong to kill a child in the womb? Yes. It says, thou shalt not kill. But is it a life? Yes, God has revealed to us that inside the womb, he's knitted together perfect. He, he, he's, he said, in the womb, I formed you. I knitted you together. I crocheted you. That's the actual term. I crocheted you in the womb. It's a life. He used common sense. What about the lying dilemma? What happens if you've got two things, though? You're, it, you, either, you, you either lie or you tell the truth. I mean, you're, it, it, oh no, excuse me. I either, if I lie, somebody is going to be saved. If I tell the truth, somebody's going to be harmed. God can rescue him. So you tell the truth, right? Nazi Germany, you guys, have, you've been to college. Here's your dilemma. You're a, you're a German household. And inside your basement, you have Jewish folks hiding. Hello? It's us Nazis. Come on in. One question. Are there Jews in this house? What do you do? Dr. Rescue. John, are you saying that absolutely 100% of the time you should say, they're in the basement? <laughs> Man, uh, good question. Because it applies because sometimes people ask you, what do you think of this? I go down there, what do you think of the sermon? Some of you are going to say, you could just say, it was I'm not okay. Yeah. It. <laughs> it was all right. Hey, past the mic. And you lie to my face. <laughs> you can say, I'm not going to tell you, but then they're going to look. Huh? Oh, they're going to look anyway, so tell the truth. Do you know what happened in the, with the midwives? The midwives looked at Pharaoh, and they bold faced lied to him. You know what he said? These Hebrew women, they're like horses, man. I am. I mean, they just, you, we, we go there to get the babies. And like, bam, had the baby. They're out working. The baby's in the field. Plop. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Of course, that's a little bit of my isms right there. But they lied to Pharaoh. 
What did God do to the midwives? He blessed them. You know what I find a lot of people do sometimes? They, 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 uh, man, I got like 10 minutes left at that. That's crazy. I need to hurry. Sometimes they use honesty in such a way that they're really trying to hurt. They're brutally honest. I just got to tell the truth. And every time they open their mouth, they're telling the truth with things that hurt. You know, sometimes I think it's okay to shut your mouth. Shut up, buttercup. There you go. You can add that one to their repertoire. Why? Because you're not doing it to, to, to be honest. You're doing it to hurt. And sometimes there is just this pecking order. You don't intentionally hurt people. Paul says use tact. I mean, you know, not Paul, but uh, use a little bit of tact, a little bit of love there. So it, it's a tough one. Okay, but that's that. I, I really want to hit this other subject because it's coming up. Many times, though, things are just uh, simply not black or white. You call these gray areas. Back in the day, I talked about this before, this thing right here, when it first came into the church, God's here. Um, he was here before the door even moved. When this first came into the church, it split the church. Does anybody know why? These were found solely in bars. These upright pianos. So when they came into the church, then a lot of people said, you cannot ever bring these things in here because it is their bars. And some said, it's just a what? It's just a piano. So it's harmless. It's not gonna, it's not necessarily gonna do it. So the, the church was absolutely divided. It was a gray, it really was a gray area. What do I mean by a gray area? God never really said one way or the other. I mean, he, there is no specific instruction in the Bible that says you shall not play the a, a, a piano if at one time that piano was in a bar. I mean, it's it's really not covered. Uh, there are a lot of things like that that you find in the Bible that, that some of you would say, oh, no, this is absolutely the Word of God, and there's, it's 100% foundation. Let me give you a few of them. I submit gambling is one of them. There's nothing in the Bible that says thou shalt not gamble. And many of you would say, no, that's absolutely wrong 100% of the time. I don't care what you say. Let me ask you real quickly, quick. Picture yourself an 80-year-old lady who goes to Hunts to buy herself a 7-Up. And while she's in line, she sees a scratch-off ticket with a teddy bear on it. A big teddy bear. It's cute. She buys the lottery ticket. Goes home and scratches it off. And she wins $2. And she goes and she gets her two dollars. Did she sin? She bought it because she liked the teddy bear. Did she sin? Did she cause somebody else to stumble? That's the next part. Here's the answer to the question. You're not her God. If she did it for an evil motive, she's going to be judged because of what she's did. How about this? I have a pastor friend right now, I kid you not, who smokes a cigar once every three months. No. He does. He goes out to his shed, and he sits down in his shed, and it's generally after something great has happened, and he sits there, and he lights up a cigar, and he smokes the cigar, and he... And he tastes it, and it makes the thing, and gets it all slobbery, and whatever cigar smokers do. Is he sinning? Is he? Some people, I want to ask you though, are there some people in the church that would say, 
A pastor smoking a cigar? You were, you, you better, you better shut up. That, and they'd say that too, just like that. And then so another person would hear them say, shut up, and say, you said shut up in church? You're sinning. Do you believe that to be true? Oh yeah, I get letters sometimes. Dear Pastor Mike, I enjoyed your sermon today, but I noticed that you said shut up three times, then the fourth time to say that you said it that fourth time. You need to shut up. There are there are people right there. Uh, 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 what about um, uh, greed for, or, or how about uh, running a business so that you can get rich? How about um, getting a tattoo? It is in the Old Testament under the Jewish culture right there, but does that apply to the New Testament Gentiles who would be under a culture of different culture? I know that I'm talking over 90% of your heads, but would it? How about a piercing, ears piercing? I think it was Miss B, because Miss B came up, and, and the first time she she saw me at, at the church, she came up and wanted to do this. She, she, she wanted to be nice, like it's Pastor Mike. Oh, Pastor Mike, welcome to the church. How are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> she checked for piercings! Did you? Because I had a hole in my ear. She said, oh, that's okay. Just never bring it in this you know. <laughs> Not murder, kill. Just kill, it's okay. So I can actually show in the scriptures where it's okay to get an ear pierced. But that just... Uh, how about watching secular shows? Going to the movies? Dancing? Southern Baptist? How about using debt? As a way to, to live? Those are all gray areas. It's not. It was a gray area then. Eating meat to a sacrifice. It, it, it's neither good nor it's bad. It doesn't matter. I mean, if, if they ate the med, it's not going to bring you closer to God. If you, if you didn't eat the meat, it's not going to bring you further away from God. It was a gray area. But you hit it. You hit it. There, there was another passage. A verse 13 clause. Let's read verse 13 together and I'll get you out of here in like... Five minutes. I'm like rushing through the last part of the sermon. Verse 13. Go back a little bit. I'm, I'm skipping conscience and everything. Verse 9. Be careful, however, that the exercises of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in the idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what it causes you, my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. Paul. My pastor friend would never, ever, ever, ever absolutely smoke a cigar in front of me. Why? Because he knows the minute, if I saw that and I jumped into it, by the end of the week I'd be at three packs of cigarettes a day and I would chew a can of Copenhagen a day with it. Why? I have an addictive personality. I've got to have it. And I really like tobacco that much. Drinking. Alcohol in the scriptures is an absolute, there's no sin if you drink. Regardless of what you think, there's no sin if you drink. That is, if you're above the age of 21. But the culture that we live in, there are a lot of people who give into that and it destroys lives. And the last thing we need to do is try to take our brothers and sisters down or something like that. Piercing and the tattoos and, and these different things right there. What Paul is saying is, listen, they don't really benefit you. There's no benefit in doing it. And if by doing it is going to cause them to stumble in any way, even if it's just a matter of bringing division into a church, then it is best that you just don't touch it. Ever. So let me do a synopsis. It's time. I've skipped so much. 
Number one, number one way to determine what is right and wrong is God's word, the absolute truth. He makes clear statements. Number two, use a little bit of reasoning. If he didn't cover right here, we look closely. We use him, what he has given us to try to come up to, to some determination of what is right and wrong. Number three, in those areas that are gray areas, what we do is before we... We exercise our own freedoms in there. We place the love that we have for the church, the love that we have for our brothers and sisters, and we take that into consideration, and we move forward. Those behaviors that are honoring God, those behaviors that do not dishonor God, those behaviors that don't hurt our brothers and sisters in any way, shape, or form, you're free to do that. Those things that are wrong in some way, if you care to please God, you move away from it. Amen? I know I covered a whole bunch of stuff right there. Let's pray. Father, we do. We love you so much. We just thank you that we have this opportunity to come into this building right here. Covering, trying to cover so much in such a short period of time. I do believe that every brother and sister and saint in this room need to ask the, a general question. Is What is our primary goal in life? Is it to please you? Or is it to please self? Really, if it's to please self, dang what everybody else thinks, we can just do what we want. Even if it causes division and breaks up a church, or causes people to, to lose faith, or causes people even to, given the, um, uh, to, to, I, I, to engage in something that you have told them not to do because of their, just who they are. We don't live that way, Father. We live to please you. We live to love our brothers and sisters. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Who's leading us in?